Grotebois, EPGD Attorneys at Law. We're gonna do a five minute video. And this is a great question. Are oral contracts enforceable? So the very short answer is yes, most of the time. And it's the most of the time where we make all of our money. Now, let's just talk about what a contract is, right? So back in law school, they'll teach you that you need offer and acceptance and consideration and performance, right? Those are the elements of a contract that will make it enforceable. And so offer, I offer to buy this calculator from you for $100. Acceptance, I accept your offer to sell me that cal calculator for $100. Here's the $100, here's the calculator, there we go. Done deal, that's a contract. So if you think about it, most of the time when you go into a store, you are accomplishing an oral transaction, right? I'm gonna buy this, the price is listed there, and I, you know, I, I don't, I'm not signing a big piece of paper. Okay, now why do we prefer written agreements versus oral agreements? Well, if enough is at stake, like we're talking about enough money or enough serious issues, then a couple things. First of all, we don't want there to be any misunderstandings. So that's the first advantage of a written contract, right? The disadvantage of an oral contract is he said, she said. So I thought it was $100. I thought it was $1,000, right? And if there's nothing in writing. Now, in this modern day and age, there are little ways around that. More likely than not, we're gonna have a text message, a WhatsApp chat, an email, I love emails. And so the email will confirm the terms. And so a lot of times I'll tell my clients, I'm like, listen, as your lawyer, I'm telling you not to do an oral agreement. But if you do an oral agreement, make sure that you have it in writing somewhere. So this is to confirm that you and I just spoke on the phone and we agreed to buy the calculator $400 next Tuesday, right? And so I've got the outline of the terms of the agreement. And then if the other guy or girl agrees and or if we perform, then I could later on, let's imagine in my hypothetical, there's a dispute and we end up in court. I could show the judge the email and say, hey judge, look at the email. This uh, was right after we had our call. It confirmed all the key points and then Lo and behold, we actually performed on the points. So that proves that, oh, and they didn't respond negatively, right? It's not like they responded to that email. No, I disagree. That's not what we agreed to, right? So their silence can be deemed as acceptance. Now, another thing, a lot of times in a written agreement, you'll have that stuff on page three, four, five, up through however long the contract is. Call it, they call it the boilerplate which is a pejorative term, it's derogatory, and quite frankly, uh, I, I don't like it. And I'll tell you why. Because the, 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 the key terms of the agreement, call them the business terms, are always usually on the first page or two, right? So what's the purchase price? What's the address? I'm thinking of if it's a property. Think about when you, do, when you buy a home, you'd use a real estate contract. And so, you know, when are we gonna close? Is there gonna be a financing contingency, et cetera? Those are gonna be right in the front. It, then all the stuff in the back, honestly, is for if things go wrong, right? If there's a breach, if there's a default, if there's somebody who, uh, who obviously doesn't do what they said they were gonna do. And then that's when the person calls the lawyer and the lawyer like me says, hey, send me the written agreement and I'm gonna start looking at the back. Now, what are the things that are included in a written agreement that often are not included in an oral agreement? Well, we might have an attorney's fee clause. Most people are not gonna have an oral agreement where they then say, oh, and by the way, if one of us breaches, the losing party shall be, or the prevailing party shall be entitled to reasonable attorney's fees and costs. They're never gonna say that, right? They're never gonna say, oh, and if we have a dispute, it's gonna be handled in Broward County. It's just not something that people would do in a normal oral agreement. I, I mean, I imagine they could, but those are the things that we put in a written agreement, and, and they might even be things that you don't even think of when you were saying, yeah, $100 for the calculator, and then you go to the lawyer, and the lawyer's like, hey, man, wait a minute, what about all these other important things? So the, the reason we want a written agreement versus an oral agreement is all those other things, because those things can be very important when things go sideways. Now, let me make a very important point. There's a thing called the statute of frauds, and the statute of frauds says that there are certain types of contracts that cannot be oral, no matter what. So anything involving land. So I promise to sell you my house, Does, it's not enforceable. So later on you're like, hey, wait a minute. Hey judge, he promised to sell me his house. Anything involving land must be in writing. Um, anything involving a sale of goods over a certain amount. Um, and so if we're talking about big numbers, we just can't have an oral agreement. It, can, it has to be a writing. Um, anything involving an expectancy of an inheritance, right? So if somebody says, yeah, I'm gonna waive my right to mom's uh, inheritance when she passes away. So guys, in real life, 
This type of stuff comes up all the time. I got a case for you right this minute. A lady, a lady, uh, a widow now, is there with her husband in front of his kids. It's the second or third marriage. And she says in front of the kids, I agree that I'm not going to make a claim on the, on the homestead property. Homestead is in Florida, the home that you live in with your spouse um, or just live in. But in this case, they were married. So everyone heard her. There's no doubt that she said it. Well, here we are five years later, dad's dead and she's making a claim on the homestead. And everyone's like, well, wait a minute. You said that uh, you were disclaiming your, your right in the homestead. Can't do it, has to be in writing. It's as though it never happened. So guys, if it's important, if it, and, and, and you know, the reason is land is usually really expensive, but if it's important, go talk to a lawyer. Don't be cheap. Make sure you're getting the good advice. These people probably could have come to my office and for less than a thousand bucks, I would have saved them. What is now the children are going to lose the house. The house is going to go to the widow because she's going to claim her homestead rights. So guys, give me a call. Oral contracts. Don't do them. Eric Rodebois. Thanks.